white. Clove of garlic, half a cup of toasted cashew nuts and one cup of grated cheese into a food processor and process until finely chopped. With the food processor running, gradually pour a quarter of a cup of oil down the feed tube to form a thick paste. Heat through one pouch of Watty's Dining and Country Tomato and Vegetable Soup until hot and ladle into bowls. Spread each crouton with a teaspoon of the parsley pesto and place one or two in the centre of the bowls. Sprinkle over a little extra grated cheese and then place the bowls under a hot grill and grill until the cheese has become golden. Now I'd serve some extra croutons on the side. They make a perfect match for the soup. The Network News and Homes are next on one. After Coronation Street, Documentary New Zealand considers our real estate dreams reliance on location, location, location. New Zealand leading your news hour emergency measures as a prolonged power blackout hits a Portiki in the Bay of Plenty. Northern homeowners count the cost as torrential rain causes major slips. A rally driver's wheel problems get him in hot water with the law. And toy retailers in a spin as Telly Tubby Mania hits the shops. <laughs> Our top story, 9,000 residents in the Eastern Bay of Plenty are facing a second night without power. An explosion in two Transpower Transformers has left homes, farms and businesses in the dark between Waiatahi and Cape Runaway, including Apodiki and Edgecombe. Schools are closed, farms are relying on tractors to power milking sheds and businesses forced to either shut up shop or operate on generator power. Ewart Barnsley has more. A sound familiar to many Aucklanders, a power generator at work, this time in Church Street, Opotiki, a power blackout costing the community thousands. I'd say uh, in loss of uh, product in the fresh food department today, it'd be $20,000 at least. Other shops have been forced shut. Children have the day off school. There's no electricity to power petrol pumps. One generator is needed to stop Opotiki sewerage works from overflowing. People on dialysis machines, etc., we've provided uh, generators. The hospital's uh, okay, they have reserved generators, um, and so uh, no danger to consumers. Many rely on alternative sources of energy. That's providing an economic windfall for some. Sold over 300 sausages, a bucket of mince, I think it is. Yeah, a bucket of mince and about six packs of bacon. Townies aren't the only ones in the dark. There's no electricity in the milking sheds. Tractors generating emergency supplies. This is about the third time in the last 10 or 15 years we've had this problem. A convoy is being sent to Opotiki with seven generators. That should be enough to restore power to the whole region, hopefully tonight. The permanent supply can't be guaranteed until Transpower repairs the blown up transformers. That may be a long, dark, 24 hours away. For many, this will be the second cold night in the dark. You at Barnsley, One Network News. In the far north, it's heavy rain and road slips that have created huge problems in the past few days. But northern homeowners have also suffered as land has slipped at picturesque northern beaches. John Stewart reports. Mackenzie Bay on the Whangarei Heads, the beauty of the bush slashed by a huge ugly scar. Hundreds of tons of clay and rubble came cascading down this hill last night, more this morning. It smashed into this house, runaway trees spearing up through the roof. Today, homeowner Vera Anka was comforting her four children, the oldest distraught at the carnage wreaked by Mother Nature. Oh, well, it's totally up to the rain and, and, the, and the land. Probably up to the rain in the land. Well, you've got four little ones. How have they been taking seeing their home threatened like this? It's tough. It's tough. The council has asked the family to move out until the water drains away, the land settles, but the danger may not be over yet. There's a lot of water under it. The culvert's blocked up. This culvert under that tree is blocked up, so the water's going over the top. There's a big dam of um, mud and uh, up the top there that's still got to come down, so it will come down. Further south, also on Northland's east coast at Langs Beach, three houses are under threat from a long, winding crack opened up by the non-stop downpour. Once you're down on the ground, you can see the effect that some 250 millimetres or 10 inches of rain has had on this hillside over the last three days. Look up the hill, you can see a straight line. It's coming straight down where the earth has opened up, right across here, and then it cuts across 
the uh, corner of these people's house. As you can see, the patio has been ripped away from the wall. And back at Mackenzie Bay, a mother comforts her children in shock as their safe haven lies threatened in the path of a landslide. John Stewart, One Network News. Sparks flew as international rally champ Colin McRae took to the highway this morning, but the Scottish speedster's antics on the open road earned him not applause from Rally of New Zealand fans, but attention from the police. Michael Holland explains. Colin McRae's mayhem was the spectator who got too close, though the Scottish star got too close to the law, while speeding on only three wheels on the open highway. Uh, his wheel was still flying to pieces and uh, part of his suspension came off and just shattered my windscreen. Other parts came through the open window of the car and... McRae had suffered a puncture on a high-speed special stage and was desperate to get back to a service crew. Yeah, we, we didn't have the spare so we had to drive slowly back to service. But there's some dispute over how slowly he actually went. The spectators who tried unsuccessfully to keep up with McRae on the winding highway said he was travelling at up to 120 kilometres an hour on three wheels. His damaged Subaru was trailing sparks and pieces of metal. It could have had potential to be really nasty. Um, it's probably fortunate that uh, nothing major happened out of it. McRae was playing down his encounter with the police. Yeah, no, they were, they were very understanding. They helped us out and gave us an escort back. So what did you say to him? That's between Colin and myself at the moment. <laughs> He knows my views and he knows how lucky he is at the moment to still be uh, in the rally. And tonight, police say they won't be taking the matter further. Michael Holland, One Network News. Rally organisers say they're unaware of the incident. Later in the news hour, we'll look at the financial windfall the rally brings to rural New Zealand towns. Police tonight are calling for the Department of Conservation to smarten up its act following costly and pointless searches on Mount Taranaki at the weekend. 35 searchers and a helicopter were involved in one search for a missing tourist which cost thousands of dollars. Today, Doc admitted it knew five days ago the missing person was safe and well. Penny Deans reports. Searchers were out on Mount Taranaki twice at the weekend. Police and volunteers responding to Department of Conservation alerts that trampers were missing. In both cases, the trampers, a German woman and a British man, had lodged their plans in dock intention books when they set off, but reported their return to different dock officers. The tourists that were on the mountain had actually done the right thing. They had actually informed uh, uh, the dock stations that they had come off the mountain, they'd come off a different place to where they went in and the communication uh, hadn't been passed on to the correct source. So more than 30 searchers put themselves at risk in wintry conditions looking for people who weren't there. They're not very happy and they don't like uh, going on a wild goose chase. We are concerned that we raised the alarm unnecessarily but we're not concerned that we raised the alarm because we thought people were missing. While Doc believes it's better to err on the side of safety, police want them to smarten up their communications to save precious time and money. Penny Deans, One Network News. Auckland Airport's share float is a record breaker, four times oversubscribed. The government says every New Zealander who applied will receive shares, even though 40% of the float will go to foreign investors. And critics say the government could have cut a better deal. Political editor Linda Clark reports. Another smooth takeoff. Auckland International Airport shares begin trading tomorrow. The government selling its 51% stake. We went out to ask New Zealanders to invest in their own country, and they have. And the emerging evidence suggests that they wanted a long-term investment. 68,000 New Zealanders have applied for a slice, 48,000 of them first-time investors. Still, 40% of the shares will go to foreigners. Valued at $1.80 a share, the total sale raising $390 million for the government. Uh, you've got to be a Kiwi, I'm afraid. Kiwi. Former All Black right. captain Sean Fitzpatrick well, and a $4 million ad campaign selling the float. What a float, chief. Everyone who made an application got a stake, yes. Only not as much as they'd like. The ads so successful, there were too many subscribers. So two-thirds of investors get less than they wanted. That runs a couple of risks that people will not necessarily reinvest their refund checks into the stock. Um, and secondly, that uh, people will get disillusioned with the market as a consequence. Those New Zealanders who have not got all the shares that they would like can be in there on the market tomorrow 
buying the, the requisite amount they do want. As for the price... I think the price has turned out to be a reasonably fair price. There were predictions up around the $2 mark. New Zealand First opposes selling state assets, yet approves of this, saying it gives ordinary mums and dads the chance to become shareholders. Yet they may own less than they wanted, and come tomorrow, if they choose to sell the airport to foreigners, they can. Linda Clark, One Network News. Geographically, more shareholders came from Auckland, which isn't surprising, but the region with the next biggest interest was Southland. And another hot property goes on sale in New Zealand tomorrow. The Teletubbies, four English creations that look and behave like toddlers, will make their first appearance in the shops. And Greg Boyd reports on a craze that has parents ordering the soft toys weeks ahead. <laughs> They look like they've been dreamt up by someone who chewed on one too many crayons as a child. But Tinky Winky, Dipsy, La La and Poe are the biggest quartet since John, Paul, George and Ringo. They're the Teletubbies and they're a phenomenon. Just ask the people selling them. So the first two deliveries have actually sold out based on the pre-order vouchers, and we've been absolutely amazed at the speed in which they sold. In fact, we sold uh, some 10,500 in less than three days. The warehouse, Toy World and farmers are also stocking the toys and expect any Teletubbies not pre-sold will be gone by lunchtime. I think it's their facial expressions, the material it's made of is very nice and cuddly, and I think they're just appealing for the, the young age group. Good news for novelist Geoffrey Archer, whose $30,000 investment has reaped millions in the past year. Oh, I think we could probably sell three times what we get in. All well and good, unless you're one of the parents who's dipped out. We're not taking any telephone sales at the moment. It's first in, first sale. The first Teletubbies leave the shelves tomorrow morning in Auckland's New Lynn. Teletubbies! Greg Boyd, One Network News. Coming up later, a new album from Kiwi entertainer Dave Dobbin, his first in four years. But just ahead, Papua New Guinea's tsunami disaster forces more people from their homes. A trapped miner in Austria is rescued after 10 days underground. And a visiting air crash expert has some safety advice for travellers. Deirdre thinks she has an ally. Thank heaven for you. But what is he hiding from her? Have you told her how you feel? How the hell am I going to tell her? Will the friendship survive? Well, I'm sorry, but I can't do it. Why? There's a spot of bother over at the Rover's return. What's going on? Well, it's dead simple, so does Jackal. No check, no staircase. What will they do? You're not going to leave us up here, are you? The curious are out as drastic measures are taken on Coronation Street. This week on One.